Hello, and welcome to my lecture, part of the Growth Astronomy School on Observational Techniques for Transient Studies. I'm Melissa Hayes-Gerke from the University of Maryland, a partner in the Global Growth Collaboration. Growth stands for Global Relay of Observatories Watching Transients Happen, and we are an international team of astronomers that have joined forces to explore the dynamic universe uninterrupted by daylight. We use a network of observatories in a way similar to a relay race. The baton is passed from one observatory to the next as the Earth rotates and daylight breaks in different locations. That allows us to react quickly when interesting explosions are detected and reported by wide field surveys, but being fast is just one important aspect in the discovery process. The other one is to be able to look at cosmic objects at various wavelengths each revealing different properties and technique and physics. The lectures and tutorials in this school will walk you through various tools and techniques that will allow you to explore transients at all wavelengths. My lecture in particular will focus on light curve analysis. The light curve analysis module has the following learning goals. By the end of this module, the student will be able to construct scientifically plausible phase diagrams from a raw light curve containing many epochs. Student will be able to understand how characteristics of the light curve, such as shape and period, can be used to identify the type of variable observed. And finally, the student will be able to use the string length, Fourier analysis, and or lone scargle periodogram methods to determine scientifically plausible periods from raw light curves. So this is what you should be able to do by the end of this module and the uh, hands-on module that will be involved with Python. And so we'll go on and get to each of these ideas in this lecture. So a light curve is a series of measurements of brightness over time. And so you can see in this light curve, we've got the x-axis is Julian date, so this is time, and it's over a pretty long period of time. And the y-axis is apparent magnitude. And so you can see here that this object is getting brighter and dimmer and brighter and dimmer over a period of time and a long period of time. So this is a periodic variable, and it is changing brightness. And we see that with the light curve. When analyzing light curves, we looked for characteristic light curve shapes and periodicity. And so I have a, a, a figure here that we'll be revisiting later on in the lecture, but you can see rows of different astronomical objects, different types of stars, and what you can see is that their light curves are not all the same. So the top row, for example, has a light curve pattern that is very similar to each other. But then if you go down to the middle row, you can see that the light curve pattern is different. And then the fourth row down, you can see a different pattern again. And then in the bottom row, you can see a different pattern to the light curve. And so these are all characteristic shapes of the light curve. And when we talk about the periods, we'll see that the periods have differing lengths. So let's go on and look at some of the things that can cause uh, variability, that have variability. So the next slides are going to show light curves for different types of variable objects. And so as we're going through these, I want you to think about how do the light curve shapes compare across different types and how do periods compare across different types. So these are the characteristics that are going to differentiate these uh, types of variable objects. And so I'm going to talk about these in no particular order because all of these are pretty common astronomical objects. So the first type of variable star that I would talk about is eclipsing binaries. And so an eclipsing binary, binary obviously is two stars that are orbiting around each other. And an eclipsing binary is what we call it when uh, the stars are oriented so that we are looking at the orbital plane edge on. So that the eclipse is uh, when one star passes in front of the other star and blocks some of its light. And so you can see physical rep representations on the left-hand side of this slide, because depending on the relative surface temperatures of the two stars and the exact orientation, you can get different shapes to the light curves. But they all have a fairly typical shape 
of the eclipses. Okay, and so then what we see on the right is there are different types of light curves for eclipsing binaries, and they're kind of showing similar to the ones on the left, but these are real light curves, the ones on the right. And so you can see here that the periods of these objects are quite short. So the period of the middle one, for example, is a little less than half a day, so a little less than 12 hours. The period of the bottom one is almost three quarters of a day, so almost 18 hours. And so eclipsing binaries tend to have periods that are on the order of hours, and they can, in fact, also be much shorter than these examples that I've shown, but they're all relatively short period. And so these are eclipsing binaries, one type of um, variable star. The next type of variable star that I'm going to talk about are pulsating variables. So pulsating variables are stars that literally get bigger and smaller in diameter over time. And you can see that represented in the diagram on the top. And as they change in size over time, their surface temperature also changes over time. So when the star is in its largest diameter, it also has its coolest surface temperature. And then as it contracts in size, it also gets to be a hotter surface temperature. And so pulsing is the idea of it pulsating in and out, in and out as it uh, contracts and expands in size. And it changes the surface temperature of the star. Now the colors here are used to represent the surface temperatures of the star, but the changes are not necessarily this dramatic to change it from red to blue. That would be a very large temperature change. It's just to show you the idea of that. But the star's luminosity, and therefore the brightness that we see from it, depends on both the uh, size of the star and the surface temperature of the star. And typically with pulsating variables, when the star is the hottest, that's also when it's the most luminous and therefore brightest to us. And so we can see that pulsating variable stars will have over time a change in luminosity, which we perceive as the change in brightness. And it is pretty strictly periodic. So it repeats on a very rhythmic pattern. And there's a number of different types of uh, periodic variable stars. And I'm going to show some light curves for those in just a moment. And some of the types are Cepheids, Delta Scuti's, R.R. Leary's, and Mira's. And of those two, the uh, Cepheids and R.R. Leary's are standard candles. And so they can be used to find distance if you know their period, so the period of their pulsations. So let's look at some light curves for these objects. So on these diagrams, the top three rows of both diagrams, the left and the right, are Cepheids. And so you can see a pretty characteristic shape for them in the sense that the, the light curve becomes brighter in a shorter period of time than it dims down and becomes fainter. So there's a pretty sharp increase in brightness and then a slower decrease in brightness. And so that's a pretty typical shape for Cepheids. And uh, Cepheids tend to have periods from days to weeks, maybe even a couple months, but they tend to be the longest of the ones on this diagram. So those are the top three rows of objects are Cepheid variable stars. The fourth row in both of the diagrams are eclipsing binaries. And so you can see, oh, excuse me, the fourth row only on the left diagram is eclipsing binaries. And so we talked about them a moment ago and they were just in the figure, so I didn't cut them out. So you can see another example of them. And they have periods in hours. The bottom row of the left diagram shows Delta Scuti variable stars, and they tend to have periods in hours. So again, very short. But you'll notice that they don't have the same kind of uh, very neat repeated pattern as the Cepheids and the eclipsing binaries, and I'm going to show you a few more types in a moment. Delta Scuti's tend to have a little bit more of a chaotic looking pattern to their light curves. Now the diagram that's on the right hand side, the three columns and five rows on the right hand side, are showing RR Leary variable stars, and again you can see that they have a little bit of a different shape to them. They look fairly similar to Cepheid variable stars, except that their periods tend to be a little shorter, so they're only a few days, and they tend to have a little bump uh, down in the faintest part of the light curve before the abrupt rise to the brightest part of the light curve. And so there's little differences that can be kind of subtle, but that can help distinguish between the different types of variable stars. 
Now I want to show you one more type of periodic variable star here. And these are Miras. And so Mira variable stars are named after the star Mira, which is the prototype for this type. And they have periods in terms of months. And so these are very long-term variable stars. And if you look at the uh, x-axis, the time axis on these light curves, you will see that they're over hundreds, if not a few thousand Julian days. And so they do change quite a bit in brightness, a number of magnitudes in brightness, but over a very long period of time. And so these are distinct light curves and lengths of periods that can be used to identify the type of object that you may be observing just from its light curve. Another type of variable star is uh, variables that are variable due to stellar activity. So this would be sunspots and plages in visible light. And I have a, an image of the sun here showing sunspots on the sun. And the period of this variability is about the same as the period of rotation of the star. So it's just how long it takes for the star spots to rotate around and dim the light so that we can see that change of brightness. So that'll be hours to days. Younger stars typically will rotate more quickly and then they slow down as they age. And so on the light curve diagrams on the right side, I have rotation periods from star spots for stars that are in or near the star cluster NGC 6791. And so you can see that they're pretty short periods. You might not be able to read the text as well, but they have one day, a half a day, 1.3 days, 0.4 days, 0.6 days, 0.6 days. And so these are relatively short periods. So these stars must be pretty young and they're rotating rapidly. Now, one of the things that you'll notice is that the light curves are not all the same for variability due to star spots. And that's because the number of star spots on the face of the star will change gradually over time. And so if there's just one spot on the star, uh, then as it rotates, you'll see that spot come and go, and then you'll just get a nice sine curve oscillation in the brightness. But if there are different numbers of star spots, if they're different sizes, they will then make different contributions to the brightness of the light curve. And that would give a different sort of pattern to the light curve. And so you can see that here with the uh, light curves that they're showing here. And so the light curves are not as quite as neatly repeatable as something like eclipsing binaries or the pulsating variable stars. Another type of variable star that's fairly common are called cataclysmic variables. And these are stars that are also in binary systems, but they don't necessarily eclipse each other. It is, it is possible for them to eclipse each other, but most of them do not because that's a more uncommon alignment for the orbits to be right for that. So what's happening with a cataclysmic variable star is there is a white dwarf that is orbiting around uh, some type of giant or supergiant and the white dwarf is accreting gas from the giant star. And as the gas uh, spirals into the surface of the white dwarf, the gas that um, builds up on the surface of the white dwarf will gradually heat up, and then it will start a thermonuclear fusion of hydrogen and create a burst of light and energy. And we see that as a sudden increase in brightness of the binary star. And so that's what we're seeing here in two different light curves are for two different cataclysmic variables. And you can see in the top light curve how the brightness of the star was pretty constant and then it had a dip. And then all of a sudden a burst of brightness and then it declined and was steady for a while. And then a burst of brightness and decline and so on. And down on the bottom uh, light curve, which is for a different cataclysmic variable star, you can also see the sudden increase in the brightness and decrease. So when the increase and decreases happen, they tend to be pretty sharp, but they are not strictly regular. Okay, so they do not happen on a strictly regular period of time because the accretion of the gas from the giant star can be uneven. It's not necessarily a well-metered process that will cause it to happen on a repeating regular basis. Another type of variable object, not a variable star in this case, are asteroids. So asteroids are rotating around an axis, as I show there on the uh, figure at the top. And since asteroids are generally not spherical in shape, as they rotate, we see different cross sections of their volume. 
And so if we see a larger cross section, that's going to reflect more sunlight toward us. So the asteroid will appear brighter. And then as it rotates around and we see a smaller cross section that will reflect less sunlight towards us, so the asteroid will look dimmer and so on. And so as the asteroid rotates then, we can see the change of brightness. It'll be a nice repeatable pattern and we can determine the rotation period of the asteroid. And one thing that makes this asteroid different from the other types of periodic phenomena is that we expect generally two maxima and minima for the asteroid as it's rotating because we have to see sort of all four sides of it as it's rotating. So generally we see small and big and small and big. And so down the bottom, I have an actual example of uh, light curves from asteroids, so two different asteroids. The, so the asteroid there on the left is 22 Calliope. And so you can see that it again has two maxima and two minima. And then the maximum that looks like it's coming up at the end is actually repeating the one at the beginning. So two maxima, two minima, and they're uneven. So that means that like one end and then the opposite end of the asteroid are not reflecting as much light toward us from the sun. And that could be because the asteroids are lumpy. It could be because some have craters and shadows and some ends don't. It could be differences in albedo. And so asteroids can have very complicated light curves. And I show that on the second asteroid on the right. Uh, so you can see there that it does have two uh, large maxima and two minima, and then it repeats again at the end. But in the minimum, uh, the second minimum, you can see that there's a little peak in the bottom there. And so this is a very complicated light curve as well, but it does repeat very nicely over time. And so this can tell us not only the rotation period of the asteroid, but also something about the shape of the asteroid. Now, asteroids generally have very short rotation periods in terms of hours. And so the one on the left, Calliope, you can see has a period of about 4.1 hours. The one on the right has a period of a little bit over 11 hours. Okay, so asteroids have pretty short rotation periods. So now usually when astronomers are able to determine the period of variability, they also determine the shape of the light curve. And I'm gonna go into that in a moment and you'll see how the two kind of go hand in hand. So if you want to know the period of variability, you almost always end up with the shape of the light curve as well. And both the period and light curve shape are crucial to identifying the type of object that you're looking at if it is an unknown object. So it's useful to look at the light curve phased by the period of variability. And some of the previous light curves we looked at were looking at what I would call the raw light curve or the unfazed light curve where the x-axis is just time with no, no modification, just over time. And some of the light curves we were looking at previously were what I would call phased light curves. So they've been phased over the period of the asteroid. So to explain what I mean by a phased light curve is if we look at the top light curve for the asteroid 1906 NAIF, this is the raw light curve. And so it goes on the x-axis from zero up to uh, 80, 90 hours. I can barely read that. So 90 hours, so that's just over time. So it's the number of hours since their first epoch. And so that's a long period of time. And what you can see there is in the light curve, there are gaps. Now, why are there gaps? Well, daytime, first of all. And second of all, probably weather or if you have to share the telescope with other astronomers, you'll have gaps for that as well. And so you can see that if you were looking at the raw light curve there at the top for this asteroid, it would be difficult to tell what the rotation period of it was because of the gaps. So what we do is we can phase the raw light curve and make a phase light curve. And what we do is we make a guess at the period, or maybe we know the period from some other reference, so we make a guess at the period, and then we chop up the raw light curve into segments that are length of that period. So if we were to make a guess about the period of uh, 1906 NAIF, we would maybe guess, well, you could look from, if I use my cursor here, we could look from peak to peak, and about how many hours is that? Like 12 hours, 10 hours, something like that, and same thing here. We could kind of make a guess. 
and then we chop up the light curve. These vertical lines are showing how we would chop up the light curve into those segments, maybe 10 hours or 11 hours, 12 hours, and we try something out, and then we stack those segments on top of each other. So each of these vertical parts, these vertical strips of the light curve, we stack on top of each other because we think that they are going to be showing the same parts of the light curve. And so if we have the correct period, when we stack up those chunks of the light curve on top of each other, we get the phase light curve like is shown on the bottom. And so that's for 11 hours. So it took the data from the top light curve, um, cut it up into 11 hour long segments, stacked those on top of each other, and then plotted the points again. And now on the x-axis, we don't really have time, we have what we call phase. And phase goes from zero to one, and you can think about that as the percentage of the way the asteroid is through its rotation period, or the periodic variable star is through its period. So if the phase is 0.1, then it's 10% of the way through its period from the starting point. If it's 0.5, then it's 50% of the way through, and so on. And the phase is just an arbitrary starting point. Now, often when phase curves are plotted, they usually plot a little bit longer than just zero to one, just so that you can see how kind of the beginning and the ends of the light curve match up. So often you'll see a couple tenths added on or sometimes double phase zero to two, and they're just showing two periods of the light curve. And so looking at phase plots, phase light curves, is a really useful way for seeing the shape of the light curve and uh, verifying the period of the light curve if we found it by some method. So the phase light curve is calculated by computing the phase of each observation. And so you can he see here that the uh, Greek letter phi is the phase. And then we use the time of the observation and the time of our starting point, which I've represented as big E, divided by the period. And then we have to subtract off the integer value of that because the phase is just a fraction. And so that's how you can compute the phase. And you will be using the phase in the Python notebook that we will be working on in the live hands-on session. So phasing a light curve with a long time baseline will yield an extremely precise period. So I show here a variable star from the Intermediate Palomar Transient Factory. And it has an unphased light curve, you can see at the top, that goes from zero to about 3,000 Julian days. And so that's a very long, raw light curve, and it's unphased. But what that means is that if you split this up into a phased light curve, if you do not get the period very, very precisely correct, then everything will be a little bit off. And that amount that you're a little bit off will add up over those 3,000 days, and your phase light curve won't look any good. It won't look like anything that you would recognize. But if you get the light curve just right and very precise, then you will get a nice phase light curve. And so you can see the phase light curve at the bottom. This is for a Cepheid variable star with a period of 32.27713 days. And if it was not that precise, the uh, phase light curve would not look so coherent and representative of a Cepheid. And so this is one of the big advantages of having a long time baseline of observations, as long as you have enough uh, data points during that time baseline. So now we're going to be talking about a number of different period determination methods. And so the first period determination method we're going to talk about is, uh, so one method to determine the period from a light curve is what is called the string length minimization method. So in this method, one imagines joining each of the data points together with a length of string. So how do you do this? Well, so first of all, you would just generate a list of many trial periods that you think would be plausible for the object. So if you were doing an asteroid, you might do one hour, 1.1 hour, 1.2 hours, 1.3 hours, 1.4 hours, and so on. So you generate all these trial periods, and then you phase the light curve by each of those trial periods. So if you have 100 trial periods, you'll create 100 phase diagrams. And then for each of those trial periods and the phase plots that you have, 
you calculate the string length. And so this is where you imagine taking your face plot and taking the data points that are on it and just tying them together with a length of string and going from point to point to point to point to point. And so you calculate then the length of the string that you'll need. And that's shown here by this calculation. So uh, theta is the string length. And you can see that it's the sum of the phased magnitudes, the difference in the phase magnitudes. So it's just with the adjacent points in time, or rather in phase. And then divided by the uh, phase magnitude minus the average magnitude. And each of those quantities, top and bottom, are square. And that's just to make it so that it does not become negative. And so that will give you a length of your string. And then you compare for each trial period after they've been phased, the string lengths. And this trial period with the minimum string length is likely the true period. Because that means that the data points went together and fit adjacent to each other very closely. There was not a lot of scatter up and down, and so you didn't need a long string to do that. And usually that indicates a coherent light curve. Now, there can be exceptions to this. The string length method is not always uh, reliable, but it is a good starting point for calculating the idea of the period. The second period determination method that we're going to talk about is called Fourier analysis. And so in this type of period determination, what you would do is you would fit trial sets of sine curves to the data. And so this would be certainly more than one sine curve, because unless you're really lucky, your data are not just going to look exactly like one sine curve. But you fit a set of them. So a potentially complex repeating light curve shape can be created by combining multiple sine waves. And then each trial set of sine curves represents one true period or repeating light curve shape. And so I want to show you that idea here. So in my diagram that I have, you can see that the top diagram has a very complex wave shape. We can see it's got an overall kind of sinusoidal pattern, but then there's a number of smaller wiggles to it that uh, are at a smaller scale. And so that complicated wave at the top can be made by a set of three waves that are summed together. So a first order wave that is shown in blue that has a lower frequency, a second order wave shown in green there with a higher frequency, and a third order wave with the highest frequency. And if those are added together, the sum becomes the wave that you see at the top. And so in this way, you can represent almost any light curve shape with a set number of sine waves. Now you can have as many sine waves as you want, but at some point it becomes unrealistic. So you have to use a little bit of uh, judgment on this, but this can be used to fit light curves and to figure out the true period. So each trial period involves a set of sine waves that are re represented by this function. And so this is something that you could use uh, later on. We won't be using this one in particular in the Python notebook, but this is one that you could be trying out. And so the uh, V is the uh, light curve. And so you, you make a mean magnitude of it, so that's V bar, just so that you have sort of a zero point on your Y axis. And then you sum together these terms. So we have both a sine term and a cosine term. There are Fourier coefficients, so A and B. You put in a trial period P, and then you have the time of your data point. You also pick a zero point time, and that's T zero, and then the number of orders, and that's what you're summing over is the number of orders. So the number of orders to be included in the trial set of sine waves. So the more orders you have, the more sine waves you are including in your uh, attempt to fit the light curve. And so it can become very complex very quickly, but this is how you would work that out. So for each trial, the function is fitted with a linear least squares to the light curve data. And then a trial range of periods and orders are fitted. And so again, you have to try a bunch of different uh, trial periods in order to see which one turns out to be the best. With many trial sets of sine waves, it can be difficult to determine which set best represents the true period. 
So for each trial, the root mean squared RMS difference between the set of sine waves and the light curve phase of that trial period can be calculated. And then the smallest RMS would indicate the best fit between the trial set of sine waves and the light curve data points. And so I show an example of the RMS here. So on the x-axis of this graph, we have the period in hours. This was done for an asteroid light curve. And then on the y-axis, we have the RMS. And so what you can see here is that the lowest RMS happens at between 7.2 and 7.3 hours. There's a very distinct minimum there. And so that would indicate then that that is the best trial period that was done. And then the RMS of the other trial periods was significantly larger. The third period determination method is to search for periodic signals in the light curve by computing something like the Fourier power spectrum from the light curve. And so a Fourier transform of the light curve breaks down the light curve into each of its contributing sine wave frequencies. And the transform computes the power spectrum of the light curve, how much power exists in the light curve at each frequency. And so the diagram here is trying to represent how Fourier transform works. So what we see over time is shown on the left diagram that I'm indicating here with my mouse in the red. So we see this complicated light curve that has a lot of uh, troughs and peaks over time. And so what the Fourier transform does is it breaks that complicated light curve down into the constituent frequencies that make it up, the constituent sine waves. So in this case, this complicated curve is broken down into these three sine waves. And each of those sine waves have a different frequency from each other. And so then it plots the frequency that we see, how much power is at each of those frequencies. And so the Fourier transform makes a plot like is shown here in blue, where the x-axis is frequency and the y-axis is how much power exists at each of those frequencies. And in this case, since there's three main frequencies in this light curve, there are three kind of spikes, three peaks maxima in the Fourier transform power spectrum. And so that would indicate to us that these are the dominant frequencies within the light curve. And so we can use this method then to try to find, well, what frequencies have power within the light curves we're looking at. So the more contribution a sine wave of a particular frequency makes to the overall light curve, the larger the power that is computed by the Fourier transform. And so I have a couple more examples of Fourier transforms here. And so on this left diagram, you can see what I call clean signals because there's no noise on them. So this first one is just a nice sine curve. So the Fourier transform of the sine curve just shows, shows a spike at one frequency. This one here has the same frequency, but you can see the amplitude is smaller. And so there's less power. And then here we can see that this is a combination of several sine curves to get this almost like a box wave here. And so you can see a spike at three frequencies and this frequency has the most power. And then here's another complicated shape that's represented by the combination of two sine waves. And here there are two frequencies in the power spectrum. Okay, so those are clean with no noise. But of course we know that real life data have noise and so you'll have noise in your light curve as well. And so this is showing the Fourier transforms on the right of things with noise. So this top one just shows random noise. There is no signal. And the Fourier transform, the Fourier power spectrum of random noise is basically random noise. There's nothing there. The one in the, the, one in the middle then has a periodic signal with noise as well. And when this is put through a Fourier transform, you get a nice spike in a lot of power at that frequency, and then you get some noise. And then finally, this last panel on the bottom shows a signal that is quasi-periodic, so it's got almost the same period each time, but not quite, it varies a little bit, and it has noise. And so what you would see in the power spectrum of this, if you did the Fourier transform, would you, you would see not a spike at a single frequency, but a distribution across a number of frequencies that the quasi-periodic signal will be at. And then you also get some noise. All right, so let's be applying this. So 
a classic Fourier transform analysis requires the data points to be evenly spaced in time, which frankly is not likely to happen for astronomical observations. Even if you can you know, observe every night, you would still have gaps probably due to weather, due to your object rising and setting, due to whatever is happening. And so we really just can't get evenly spaced observations in time. And you could potentially bin data to make it more evenly spaced in time, but then you're uh, losing some of your time resolution in your data. So you really wouldn't want to do that if you don't have to. So a type of Fourier transform algorithm called the lone scargle periodogram was developed for unevenly spaced data. Now, due to the formulation and approximations in the algorithm, it calculates an estimate of the Fourier power. It's not exactly the same quantity as the formal Fourier transform. However, functionally, the periodogram can be used in the same way to indicate the most powerful frequencies that occur in the light curve. All right, so let's take a look at this. So here is a sample of the process. So on the left diagram, we have an unfazed light curve. So this is the raw light curve over time. And you can see it really doesn't look like very much. <laughs> it's hard to tell if it's periodic. It's hard to tell what the period is. And that's because there's uh, quite a few data points and it's also a very quite long time baseline. So if we put this into the lone scargle periodogram function, we then get a periodogram like in the middle diagram. So the middle has frequency across the x-axis, and then it has something akin to power on the y-axis. And so as I've indicated there with the arrow, the periodogram with the highest power is at 0.61 days. So this would tell us that the uh, frequency, the most powerful frequency within the light curve data is 0.61 days. And now if we phase the light curve to a period of 0.61 days, we get the phase light curve like we see on the right. And you can see that this looks much more sensible, like a periodic object. And this is in fact an R.R. Leary star. And so it has a 0.61 day period. And so this can demonstrate the power of the lone scargle periodogram because you don't have to know from the start what the period is and or have a good guess at the period. And this can show you what the period might be. The pseudo power spectrum may show power at other frequencies, and that's due to noise or harmonics in the data and the windowing of the data. So it shows, I show example of that here in this diagram. So the left-hand side shows for a light curve, a raw light curve, the periodogram. And so the period is across the bottom in days. They've changed it from frequency to period, you can do that. Typically, they're shown in frequency. And you can see that the period with the highest pseudo power is a period of 0 0.648 days. And I have marked it with the red line in the diagram. Now, it's only slightly more. And so you might say, well, is that really the period or not? Well, if we phase it to that period, then we get the phase light curve that's like on the right. And we can see that clearly, that looks like a pulsating variable star. So that's probably what the period is. Now, why, would, why was there so much power in some of these other periods or frequencies on the left diagram? So like here and then and so on. So typically these might be harmonics, like half the period or half the frequency or twice, or maybe a third or two thirds. So something with that. So those would be harmonics. And then also it could be windowing of the data. For example, if you uh, observe an object weekly, then you've got a seven day period that's being imposed on some of your data. And probably that will show up as power in your periodogram. If you can observe pretty much all night for 12 hours and then you have daytime off, then you will have a 12 hour periodicity that's the windowing of the data. And so this is something that you have to watch out for. And it can be very difficult to distinguish whether you've actually got an object that varies on a time scale of 12 hours or 24 hours, or if that's just an artifact of the data. So the lone, period period, lone scargle periodogram 
is a very useful method for searching for periods in light curves. And this is one that we will also be using in the Jupyter Notebooks when we go to the hands-on session. So here is the uh, gritty details of the loam scargle periodogram. And fortunately, in many packages, software packages, the periodogram has been included and it's a function that you can call out. But if you're interested in what's in the loam scargle periodogram, you can take a look at it here. And you can see that it's breaking down your, uh, your function, your data points, into uh, different cosines and sine curves to calculate the amount of power at each of those frequencies. And so this is something that I don't encourage you to memorize or anything, but look it up when you need it if you want to implement it. So when searching for true periods, and this goes for any of the period determination methods that we've talked about, one must ensure that the period is not an alias of the true period. So an alias period is a false period that is usually related to the true period or to the observation frequency. So common alias periods are a half or two times the true period or periods near 12 or 24 hours. So this is very similar to what I was just talking about with uh, the pseudo power spectrum for the Lone Scargle periodogram that can show you frequencies that have power that aren't actually the true period. And so this is something that you will see with many different pre, um, period determination methods is alias periods. So I show an example of that on the bottom. So the diagram that's on the right on the bottom shows the correct period for the rotation of this asteroid. And that's 8.3110 hours. And yes, it is that precise. And so you can see this asteroid has a very unusual looking light curve because it does have four maxima and four minima in its light curve, but it's also repeating very nicely and the points track very carefully over the same shape for the light curve. So yeah, this is the shape of the light curve. On the left side, we have an incorrect period and the incorrect period is 4.1660 hours. Notice that that's half of the true period. And so when you look at the one on the left, the phase light curve on the left, you can kind of see why it might pop out as being a possible period because you do see that there's maxima and minima in the light curve, and, but there's more scatter in it. And we can see with human intervention here that that does not look appropriate and that the points are not repeating the pattern very nicely. And so if 4.1660 showed up as your period and you saw this light curve, then you should try a multiple of it. So then you double it and you get the true light curve. So this is something that we always have to be careful about. So when a period determination has been made, one must always examine the phase light curve to ensure that it makes sense for the type of variable object. So for example, that previous one that I showed, the asteroid light curve was very unusual in having four maxima or four minima, but that is a possibility because asteroids can have very strange shapes and differing albedos on their surfaces. And so that would be a possible true light curve shape for an asteroid. However, if you're looking at something else like a Cepheid or an eclipsing binary, then you would have some idea of what shapes for the light curves are possible and could be correct and which ones are not. And so that can help you vet your results and decide if your period determination is a good one. And so here's another example of a couple test periods that have been plotted in the phase plots for asteroids that are incorrect. And again, you can see that they're close but they do not match up correctly. They're a little offset from each other. So a couple of the rotations are offset from each other. And so it's an indication that you're close to the correct period, but it's not actually correct. Okay, so you will be applying these ideas later on in the Python notebook when we go to our live session. And this concludes this lecture. I'm looking forward to seeing this year's school participants for our follow-up live discussion in hands-on Python tutorials. This lecture and the Python notebooks from the tutorials will be made available to anyone on our website after the school. Just head to the growth webpage to download our resources and play around. Thanks for watching.